All right, uh, the roll sheet is circulating for those people that are physically here. So if you uh, haven't said anything in chat yet, please let me know that you are here. All right, so uh, we got a couple of orders of business to talk about. The first of which is that Friday is the drop date. Um, so that means I need to get off my lazy butt and return your test grades and your project grades uh, sometime this week. So I hope that those done uh, by Wednesday. Uh, another thing is that uh, early advising starts. All of you, uh, by virtue of the fact that you are in this class and ostensibly going to pass, uh, are advising with me until you graduate. Um, I sent out an email over the weekend. 25 of the roughly 65 of you have replied. Um, so the, if you haven't done so yet, please let me know when you want to advise and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I will tell you that next week, um, which is when registration starts, is going to be an absolute nightmare for me uh, because I have the senior design conference, the electrical engineering industrial advisory board meeting, all that to prepare for, as well as my classes, as well as advising. So um, yeah, if you want me to advise while you were in a good mood, get it done this week. Not at all, no. So everything from here on out goes through me. So your other advisor, uh, it, it's, it's less paperwork for the undergraduate studies office to leave you officially with your current advisor and just have me do all the work. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah, well, we tried to do it the other way, and then Dr. Tim's freaked out because of all the crazy amounts of paperwork and moving stuff around that he had to do, so I was just like, well, screw it, who cares? Um, okay, so, got uh, drop date stuff taken care of, got advising taken care of. All right, let's jump into uh, common gate amplifiers. Um, This material is and isn't in the textbook. Let me explain what I mean by that. Um, in the textbook, they do everything with uh, BJTs. We're going to be doing it uh, with MOSFETs. We are going to be making an assumption with MOSFETs, and that assumption is that we are going to be neglecting the body effect, and I'll explain why we have to do that momentarily. Uh, I'm also deriving everything based on the full bias circuit that was covered in 335 as opposed to just biasing things with an ideal current source, because we know that we don't, we can't actually practically do that. So I feel like it's to your benefit to actually learn how to analyze these things properly instead of hand waving away the hard part. So with that in mind, let us talk about the frequency response of the common gate amplifier. All right. Um, so we're going to start with our low frequency response as per usual. Uh, so at low frequencies, Our circuit looks something like this. We have some resistance RD. Because we are dealing with a common gate amplifier, we take the output at our drain. Here. In the textbook, this resistor RS is replaced with a um, ideal current source. Um, so really we're kind of treating this as if there were a practical current source located at this node. Um, let's see. For the full bias circuit, we have 
our resistor R1 and our resistor R2 here. And then we're going to have some input capacitance. I'm going to call it CN here. We may have some force impedance, so I'm going to call it R sig. And then here is where we apply our input voltage. So we only have this one single capacitor to deal with. So our low frequency response is going to be pretty trivial, OK? Um, if that capacitor weren't there, does anybody know what the response to this thing would look like or how we could go about it? So let's start by talking about what R1 and R2 are doing. Okay. So, um, Brian, what are they doing? Yeah, they're just biasing it. So, because we know that there's no current that's going to branch off and flow into the gate terminal because it's treated as an open circuit at low frequencies, um, R1 and an R2 uh, for our small signal model are both connected between the gate and ground and we know that no current flows through them so effectively they do absolutely nothing to our small signal model. So we can entirely ignore R1 and R2 and really just treat this node as if it were a small signal ground. Okay, um, because it's just applying a DC voltage source to that node. All right, so that gives us this. Here is RS, and I'm going to combine these guys together just real quick as an impedance that I'm going to call ZN. And we ground this guy. So this looks like a common gate amplifier with some sort of source to generation. Anybody recall at all how we analyzed that kind of circuit? If not, I'll walk you through it again. I'm going to call this guy right here, node X. And so our voltage gain, AV, as a function of frequency, is going to be V out divided by Vx multiplied by Vx divided by Vn, um, where I guess it probably would help if I relabeled what our, our output voltage was. So what is the relationship for V out over Vx? Common gate amplifier where channel length modulation or early effect is ignored. Look it up. GMRD, that's it. So VX, or excuse me, V out over VX is simply GM times RD. Which is our mid-band gained, which means it looks like that VX over VN part is the only part that's going to have any frequency response associated with it, which makes sense because it's the part where the capacitor is connected. Um, so couple of different ways that we can look at this. Um, 
what is the resistance looking in towards the transistor? Anybody remember that, the input resistance of a common gate amplifier? One over dm. All right. So that means that our V out over Vx relationship, we're just going to have a simple voltage divider where we see that the voltage drop over Rs in parallel with one over gm is our voltage that we're looking for, right? Because as we look in, we see between node x and ground Rs and between node x and AC ground at VDD is just one over gm. So that means that we are going to have Rs in parallel with one over gm divided by Zn plus Rs in parallel with one over gm. And so let's take a moment to manipulate this guy real quick, right? Um, so let's see, we're going to have GM RD. So up here, we're going to have RS in parallel with one over GM. Down here, we're going to have R sig plus one over S C N plus RS in parallel with one over GM. Uh, if I multiply this guy by SCN over SCN, I get GM RD times SCN times RS in parallel with one over GM divided by one plus SCN R sig plus RS in parallel one over GM. And that is my transfer function for the low frequency response. So from this, I can see that I have a zero. So omega Z at what? Zero. And I have a pole omega P at one over Cn times R sig plus Rs in parallel with one over Gm. And that's it. That's our low frequency analysis. That's all it takes. Um, hopefully it's fairly obvious that if we tried to use the method of uh, short circuit time constants to estimate our uh, the beginning of the, the mid band, it would give us this literally exact same pole uh, because there's only one capacitor that we're analyzing the circuit with. So it'd be crazy if it didn't, right? All right, so any questions on the low frequency response? How would this change if RS were infinitely large? What would we do? So in your homework problems, where you're biasing these guys with a uh, ideal current source instead of a current source with some practical resistance. You would just replace Rn with infinity, which means you have Cn uh, times R sig plus one over Gm, right? Because something small in parallel with something infinitely large just looks like something small. So nothing real wild or crazy there. All right, let's look at the high frequency response. So um, our capacitance Cn is going to look like a short circuit because we're at a high enough frequency to make that happen and now we're going to have to deal with all of the internal uh, capacitances of the MOSFET. So that is going to look something like this. Here is our resistance Rd.
here is our resistance RS. I'm going to put V in here so that this guy is R sig. Here's R1. Here is R2. Um, and way out here, and you'll see why momentarily, is where I'm going to take V out. So now dealing with the internal capacitances. I have my capacitance CSB, and this one isn't going to go away this time because my source is not at the same potential as my body, which is exactly why technically I shouldn't be ignoring the body effects. All that's really going to do is just add in an extra term for our transconductance because it's going to be two current sources in parallel so we could just add them together. But for whatever reason, Dr. Batari in this book says that's too hard, so they ignore it. So I'm going to do that too this year. Um, I have my gate source capacitance. EGS. I have my gate drain capacitance, EGD, and I have my drain body capacitance, which I'm going to put up here because there's really not a better place to put it. CDB, where this is BDD. Now, one thing that I want to point out is what we mentioned earlier. Uh, resistors R1 and R2 are doing nothing more than providing the DC bias point so we can effectively ignore them. So if I erase this guy and erase this guy and put ground right here, it's really literally nothing different with regards to our AC signal. I guess technically for our full on, this should be, if this thing will write. Some bias voltage V bias, which at our small signal is going to look like ground. So what that means, so CDB obviously has one terminal connected to ground, and CSB also has one terminal connected to ground. CGD is going to have a terminal connected to our AC ground because of our DC bias voltage, and CGS is also going to have one terminal connected at ground. Uh, also because of our DC bias voltage. So I can redraw this thing uh, as this, where I'm using VDD as an AC ground so that I can see here is RD. This is CGD. This is CDB. Here's my output voltage, V out. Here is where my input signal is applied. And here, I have RS in parallel CGS in parallel with CSB. So I'm going to redraw this guy one third time, just observing everything that I've looked at here to simplify things. I'm going to call this guy ZY, which is just RD in parallel with one over S. CGD plus CDB. Here 
Switch me out. Here's our SIG. Me in. I'm going to call this guy here ZX. So I'm just going to assign node X and Y as follows. Uh, where this is RS in parallel with one over S CGS plus CSB. And I'm going to define something out here real quick. Um, let's call it CY is just CGD plus C. That's not a C. CB and CX is just going to be CGS plus CSB. So I don't have to do as much bookkeeping when I'm going to do all my manipulation. So this is what my circuit looks like in its most reduced form, which hopefully is really familiar because it's the exact same circuit we just analyzed in the low frequency range, right? So it stands to reason that our transfer function should at least be pretty darn similar. AV as a function of S is going to be, excuse me, um, ZX in parallel with one over GM divided by R sig plus ZX in parallel with one over GM. So this is the part where we have VX divided by VN. And then for V out divided by VX, we simply have the gain of our common gate amplifier, which is gonna be GMZY. So this is a very simple form. Now we gotta play with this guy to figure out where the heck our poles and zeros are. So I'm gonna look at this guy first, and then this guy is an entirely separate thing. All right. So, question? Or I thought I heard something. Nope. Okay. Oops, let's set that guy there. All right, so let's look at this ZX uh, in parallel with one over GM part, or our first part, uh, associated with the input transfer function, okay? Um, so the first thing that I wanna point out, I'm not gonna make this substitution yet, but we are going to do it, so I'll go ahead and take care of it. ZX is RS in parallel with one over S CX which is thus RS divided by SCX divided by RS plus one over SCX, which then becomes RS divided by one plus SCX RS, okay? Um, all right, so, We have VX in parallel with one over GM divided by R sig plus ZX in parallel with one over GM, um, which is the same as ZX over GM divided by ZX plus one over GM, this whole thing divided by R sig plus ZX over GM divided by ZX plus one over GM, um, which is the same as ZX divided by GM times ZX plus one over GM over 
R sig plus that same thing. Zx over gm times Zx plus one over gm. Um, so that is going to give me, oops. Sorry, it's already drifting. Zx divided by one plus gm zx over r sig plus zx over one plus gm zx multiplying through by that common denominator that we have there um let's put it here is as good as place as any and i'll try not to make my handwriting so terrible um, this is going to give us the x divided by the x plus one plus gm the x times r sig. Okay. Now I'm going to substitute in that relationship for ZX that I developed at the top. And this is where things are going to get a little bit gnarly, but it's not too bad. Um, so I'm going to do my denominator first. So I'm going to substitute in ZX. So that's going to be RS divided by one plus S C X R S plus all right so um I have one plus GM times ZX times R sig so I'm gonna multiply R sig through this guy which is gonna give me R sig plus GM ZX R sig and I'm gonna replace ZX with the expression. And to get another common denominator thing going on here, uh, I'm gonna multiply R sig by one plus SCX RS over one plus SCX RS. So hopefully you guys follow what's going on here. One plus SCX RS divided by one plus SCX RS. So that takes care of my R sig multiplied by one. Then I have GM ZX. So that's going to give me in my numerator GM RS R sig divided by one plus S CX RS. Close that guy off. And here in my numerator, I have RS divided by one plus S C X R S. And so now I have everything is over one plus S C X R S. So those all cancel each other out, right? I have a factor of that in the numerator and a factor of that in the denominator. So it all goes away, leaving me with R S plus R sig plus GM RS R sig plus S C X R S in my denominator and just RS in my numerator. So that is my first transfer function. This again is x over v. My second transfer function, I'm going to have gm times zy. And zy is going to do almost the exact same thing as zx does, right? Because zy is a resistance in parallel with a capacitance, okay? So that means that I'm just going to have gm times rd over one 
plus S C Y R D, which looks like G M R D times one over one plus S C Y R D. This bit is the V out over V X portion of our transfer function. And from this, a V as a function of S is going to look like that bit multiplied by one over one plus S C Y R D times G M R D. And we now have it in our form where we have the mid band gain multiplied by effectively a term that's gonna give us a pole times another term that's going to give us a pole. And so from this, we can see that omega P one, is R S plus R sig plus G M R S R sig divided by C X, which was C G S plus C S B. times, sorry, I'm missing, when did I do it? Yeah, sorry, uh, here where I have one plus SCX RS, this is multiplied by R sig. So I should have a factor of R sig in here. I apologize for that which is gonna give me RS R sig right here. Sorry for making that mistake. Uh, this, believe it or not, is equal to CGS plus CSB multiplied by R sig in parallel with RS in parallel with one over GM. And our second pole is a little bit easier. Omega P2 is just gonna be one over CYRD. So that's one over CGD plus CDB times RD, no zero anywhere. So we have fully analyzed this, thing, okay? So we could stop here, but I want to point something out. Since all of our capacity, uh, let me let you guys scribble stuff down and then I'm gonna scroll up in a second. All right. If we look at this circuit that I have up top here, we can observe again that all of our capacitances are between some node. Um, in this case, we call this guy Y and this guy X. We have two capacitances between node Y and ground and two capacitances between node X and ground. So we have no Miller effect to deal with whatsoever which actually greatly simplified our analysis to some extent. We don't have that weird, weird feedback capacitance. It also tells us that the capacitors don't interact with each other. So we can actually get those exact same pole results by effectively applying the method of open circuit time constant. Meaning we know that one pole is going to occur at our output because we have a capacitance at our output that sees a particular resistance. And our second pole is going to occur at our input because our input, input capacitance, CGS in parallel with CSB, 
seeing some see some other resistance. So just for the sake of argument, let's prove that to be true, okay? So I'm gonna redraw that circuit real quick. Um, so here is RD. Here is C, D, B. Here is C, G, D. RS, except that, that looks like a terrible S. Let me erase that. Here is CGS, and over here is CSB. Call this X and Y. So at node Y, Our capacitance CY is what? Just those two capacitors in parallel, right? So we'd have CDB plus CGD. If we look in at node Y from the perspective of the capacitors, what resistance do we see? It's just going to be the output resistance of our common gate amplifier, which, if we're neglecting channel length modulation, is simply RD, right? So from this, omega P for our output node at Y is just one over CY times RD, which is one over CDB plus CGD times RD. So we get the exact same Makes sense. At node X, our capacitance is EGS plus CSB. And our resistance looking in from the capacitors, right? So we are going to see between here and ground, RS, between here and ground looking up, 1 over GM, and between here and ground when we're looking at the N as a short circuit, R sig. So we have R sig in parallel with RS in parallel with 1 over GM. Giving us a pole for our input at one over CGS plus CSB times R sig in parallel with RS in parallel with one over GM. So when we have no interaction between our capacitances, which is this, the situation we had here. There's no feedback or anything tying them together or anything like that. So when we know for sure that th there's no interaction from our capacitances, we can actually use the short circuit, or excuse me, the open circuit time constant method because we're at high frequencies to get all of our poles as well. Or uh, as the book describes it, we are just associating a pole with each node, which is perfectly reasonable as long as there is not interaction between the capacitances. So uh, that's it for today. We are so far ahead of Dr. Batari that I want to slow down. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and uh, uh, the, the direct method isn't in the book at all, um, but I mean, it gets the same result, but. All right, um, so like I said, I will have your exams hopefully graded by Wednesday, but for sure at some point on Thursday so that you have 
time to make an educated decision as to whether or not you need to drop this class. I sincerely hope that none of you do, um, because that means that you're putting off your graduation for a full year. So. I guess I was struggling to figure out what I wanted to take. Uh, all right uh i'm gonna i'm gonna shut the zoom down for a moment <laughs>